There is no sense telling a newborn baby not to eat an entire pizza. <laughs> there is no sense telling a toddler to be careful to drive the speed limit the next time she borrows the car. And there's no sense telling a teenager to be careful not to spend all of their retirement money. Back in those days, life was simpler, wasn't it? We didn't feel like we had a care in the world. And the truth is, we didn't have a capacity to do a whole lot. But then all of us grew up. And we come to realize that the more we grow up and the more we mature, the more resources we gain to do a whole lot more than we were first able. And as we grow up, and as we gain more opportunities that come to our disposal, the more you and I have come to realize that maturity means negotiating a very fine line between doing what we're able to do and doing what we should do. It doesn't take long before we realize that the more abilities we develop, the more relationships we gain, the more responsibilities we require, and even the more money we make comes with it a very fine line between necessity and extravagance, between doing what is beneficial and doing what is detrimental. You see, it doesn't take long before we realize that we can't go very far in life without learning self-control. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. And there is a very fine line between doing good and creating chaos. And probably the clearest and most common place that we find this to be true in a nearly universal sense is in our relationship with money. Think about it. Back in those younger days, when you were just starting to work out and find a job, you were saving your nickels and your dimes and your dollars, doing odd jobs here and there, babysitting or delivering newspapers, or in my case, as a high schooler, fixing vacuum cleaners. Back in those days, the demands on your finances were much simpler. Life was a lot less demanding, and so were the choices that you had to make. But then you and I grew up, didn't we? We added to the mix all of the responsibilities of moving out of the house and getting married and adding children to the family and establishing a career and making more money, and suddenly, there was even greater temptation to cross that fine line. And those temptations started coming at us fast and furious because now, now that we're raising families, or for any of us who have, who have raised families, we have used the money that we've earned to do good things, to provide shelter and food and clothing, to help those in need because these are all things that we should do, but it doesn't take much. It doesn't take a whole lot to cross that fine line, a fine line that is far beyond simply providing shelter and food and clothing, because then it becomes providing a house that is better and bigger and more beautiful than any other ones in the whole neighborhood or buying high-end fashions in order to wear clothes that convince other people to perceive you as better than you really are, or filling our body with substances that in the long run really aren't good for us. There's a fine line between doing what is good and creating harm it's not to say that we should never fill our lives with good things or beautiful things or pleasurable things, but it is to say that the love of money can be so strong that it might blur the lines 
between what is important and what is extravagant, between what is good for ourselves and for our loved ones, and what is actually feeding those inner demons that are inside all of us, those shadowy temptations that are in the dark recesses of our soul that need to be addressed, and if they're not addressed, then even something as good and pure as our financial resources could actually feed those inner demons and cause harm. Maybe it should be no surprise to any of us that the Bible talks about self-control more than 80 times throughout the entire biblical narrative. It's such an important topic in a biblical sense that there isn't just a single word for self-control in the Bible. There are actually multiple Greek and Hebrew words that are translated in a myriad of ways, restraint, Discipline, self-mastery. Over and over and over again, the people of God are being constantly reminded that one of the ways that we must follow God is by exercising discernment on that very fine line between doing what is good and doing what is harmful in nearly every aspect of our lives. And then it should be no wonder to any of us that of all of the topics that Jesus ever chose to preach about during his ministry on earth, he preached about money more than any other topic except for the kingdom of God. The more we grow up, the more we come to realize that money can be a gift from God, but the love of money can actually draw us away from God and away from the kind of life that God wants for us. And that's why when Paul was writing his letter to the people in the early church and writing his letter to Timothy that Giselle just wrote for us, he is careful to use a phrase here that he doesn't use anywhere else in all of his epistles. He uses the phrase, the love of money. You see, it's not just money that is the root of all evil. Money itself is value neutral when it comes to ethics and morality. Money is just a gift from God. It's a tool and a resource that God gives to us so that we can have what we need and to supply others with what they need for their own survival and dignity and self-worth. But if you add those three words before money, then the love of money becomes an entirely different problem altogether. It's a fine line between money and the love of money. And it's a line that is far too easy to cross if we're not careful. Because the love of money means that we devote to money that portion of our hearts, a love that really ought to be going to God. And when Jesus says that the greatest commandment is to love God with all of our heart and all of our mind and soul and strength, whenever we apportion any part of that love to something else that is not God, then that thing becomes an idol, doesn't it? And that is what many have turned money into an object of worship, a diversionary object that prevents our full attention and full obedience to God. And it makes it far too easy to cross that line, that fine line between doing what is good for others and actually causing harm to ourselves. It's the only way that we can explain our society's current addiction to indebtedness. It's the only way we can spiritually diagnose the reason that so many of us are having trouble saving money like we need to for the future. And it's the only way to explain why survey after survey, time after time, to people after people, the question comes up, how much money do you think you need to solve all your problems? The same answer comes back, regardless of the people you ask. 
Every survey says that people simply believe that if they just had 10% more money than they had now, then all of their problems would go away. Fascinating, whether that respondent makes $20,000 or $2 million, people always seem to believe that if they just had 10%, just a little more money than they have now, then all of their problems go away. And what they soon discover, it's not the problem of having more money, it's being responsible and thoughtful with the money you already have. That is the cause of all of the problems. And when you believe that all you need is 10% more money, then that's just an idol. And it's a falsehood. It's chasing after something that's not real. It's generally regarded that Fred Craddock is one of our generation's finest preachers and teachers of preaching. And when he was still alive, he once preached a sermon that included a fascinating, fictitious conversation he had one day, an imaginary chat that he had with a greyhound dog that was lying on the floor of the house of one of the parishioners he was visiting. And he began the conversation with this dog by saying, uh, hey there, dog, are you still racing nowadays? To which the dog said, nope. <laughs> You're not racing. Well, don't you miss all of the glitz and glamour and excitement of the racetrack? Nope. Well, hey there, dog. Why aren't you racing anymore? Are you, are you too old? Nope. I've still got plenty of good races left in me. Well, then, it must be because you stopped winning, right? Nope. I made over a million dollars for my owner. I've won plenty of races. Oh, well, then, it must be because of the way you were treated, right? Your owner was mean to you? Nope. Even to this day, my owner treats me like royalty, like I'm the king of the house. Well, then, the reason you're not racing anymore must be because you're injured. Did you, did you do something to your body during one of the races? Nope, nope, nope. Well, I don't understand. What's the reason? Well, I quit. What? You quit racing? Why in the world did you quit? To which that old greyhound dog said, Well, one day I discovered that that rabbit I was chasing wasn't real. <laughs> That's the problem with idols. We think they're worth chasing after, but they're not real. That's the problem with anything that we choose to worship other than God, because sooner or later, that object of worship turns out to be not real after all. And that's why when Paul was diagnosing the problem in the passage to Timothy that Giselle just read for us, he saves his most rich and biting diagnosis for people who have trouble with their relationship with money. You heard her read it. It said this. Paul says, but people who are trying to get rich fall into temptation. They are trapped by many stupid and harmful passions that plunge people into ruin and destruction. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some have wandered away from the faith and have impaled themselves with a lot of pain because they made money their goal. <laughs> well, he spares no rich imagery there, does he? He says people have had such a problem with money, turning it into their goal, turning it into their idol, that this tool that ought to be used for making good is actually being used, in Paul's words, to impale themselves with pain. 
And the truth of the matter is, it's a very fine line between the two, between seeing money as a tool for good and a gift from God and as an idol that can cause us great harm. A fine line between loving God and others with our money and loving money itself. But you know, to some degree, I recognize standing here in the pulpit that I am simply preaching to the converted here. Because I know that there are many of us who get it, who understand the difference and know the seriousness of the matter. And I know this because of the results of the stewardship survey that we sent out a month ago to every member of the congregation. And an astonishing number of you returned that survey. 250 results came back to tell us about your relationship with money. And what's of particular interest to me today is the very first question that we asked of that three-question survey that simply asked this question. What do you think is the reason that some people do not make a financial commitment to the church? Why do you think it is that many people don't fill out a commitment card and turn it into the church? And your responses were as crystal clear in the spiritual diagnosis of those people as anything that I've read. You gave the top four reasons. These were the four reasons that you gave more than any others. Number one, because people don't feel like they have enough money. Number two, because people don't want to or are afraid to make a commitment that they don't think they'll be able to keep. Number three, because they aren't committed enough to God and to the church. And number four, because they don't feel like their little old gift and their small commitment to the church will make any kind of difference in a church like this. An astonishing number of you responded. And of those four responses, those comprised 70% of the reasons why people don't give. All of those reasons, by the way, have one thing in common. You want to know what the common unifying thread is among all four of those answers? It is that all of them acknowledge that very fine line between loving God and others with our money and loving money itself. Because there is a very fine line between trusting in ourselves to provide for our needs and daring to trust in a God who has given us everything we have to begin with. And there is a very fine line between simply calling ourselves Christians and actually being committed, fully committed to Jesus Christ. And there is a fine line between simply going to Hyde Park, United Methodist Church, on Sunday mornings, and actually believing in the mission of Hyde Park and supporting it. And there is a very fine line between simply staying alive and actually believing that our little old lives can make an eternal difference. Our lives are full of fine lines that we have to discern on a daily basis that separate between actions that cause good and actions that cause harm. And that's why next week, we will be inviting you to fill out and turn in your commitment card. Because in light of all these fine lines that we have to discern each and every day, we believe that one of the great antidotes to prevent us from going down a slippery slope of being irresponsible and causing harm is to turn our full lives over to God, and that includes the way we use our money. You see, filling out that commitment card and turning it in is not simply an act of supporting the budget of the church or simply helping the church pay its bills. That act of turning in a commitment card is your way of turning over to God your entire life 
and saying, God, I cannot negotiate these fine lines myself. Left to my own devices, I will choose poorly each and every time. But if I turn my full resources over to God, then I know that I can count on you to help me live my life in a way that builds your kingdom rather than tears it down, that helps other people in need rather than simply my own selfishness. Because after all, it all belongs to you to begin with. I love what the evangelical church in India is doing to teach its people this very important lesson. In the evangelical church in India, whenever somebody joins that church, whenever an adult is baptized into that community of faith, they receive a rather unusual gift from the church. You know what it is? They receive a coconut palm tree. I'm tempted to institute that gift here at Hyde Park. Because I love what they ask those people to do. They give them this sapling of a coconut palm tree and they tell a newly baptized adult, a new member of the church, to go home and plant that sapling in their home and to take care of it, to nurture it, to not abuse it to give it the water and the sunlight and the fertilizer that it needs to grow. Because as you can imagine, what happens eventually with that sapling of a tree is that it grows and starts to bear fruit. And even a young coconut palm tree will start to bear approximately $50 worth of coconuts every single year. But that's not all keep taking care of that coconut palm tree, giving it what it needs and nurturing it, eventually that tree grows to maturity to where it will double its produce and double its income to where mature coconut palm trees will yield $100 worth of coconuts for that family every year. And in India, that's a lot of money, even for the middle class. Now, why do you suppose the evangelical church in India gives these coconut palm trees to its new members? Well, for one thing, almost everyone in India is needy, and the tangible income from those palm trees helps support those families and provide for their needs. But second, those coconut palms provide a very powerful object lesson about Christian stewardship because the church instructs every new member of the church to take the proceeds from those coconuts and return 10% of those proceeds back to God. It's the coconut tree plan, that's what they call it. I'm fascinated by it because it reinforces this incredibly important and foundational Christian truth. Because you remember that these coconut palm trees didn't cost these people a single dime. When you join that church, you don't purchase this coconut tree. It's given to you as a gift. You don't deserve this tree. It's offered to you without price. And all of the proceeds that come from these trees, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars over the course of its lifetime, you didn't really earn to begin with let alone deserve it, all of it came to you without price. And that is exactly the grace of God. That's the love of God that has come freely to you without price, without merit, your relationship with God. In fact, everything you are and everything you own You didn't earn for yourself. We might think that we did with the work of our own hands, with our own skills and abilities, with our own labor contributions. We might think that everything we have and everything we are is self-made and earned by our own merit. But we didn't. Everything is a gift 
from the work of our hands and the abilities we have to the very air that we breathe. It's all a gift. And so when we're called to give 10% of the fruit of our labors, it's really just returning back to God what belonged to God to begin with. Now, in the evangelical church in India, it's not mandatory to tithe those coconuts. In fact, if a family chooses not to give that 10% back to the church, it's not like there will be an evangelical church in India coconut palm tree tithing police that will come to their house and say, hey, you owe us some coconuts. Because that's not what stewardship is about. It's not about guilt tripping or fear mongering or, or hammering these things down. It's about simply recalibrating our perception to remind us that everything we have and everything we are belongs to God to begin with. And so next week, when you come with that commitment card filled out and you turn it in into the worship service, I hope that for you it will be an admission that your life, your life is full of free coconuts and that you do so with glad and grateful hearts for a God who is simply giving you all of these free gifts. We'll invite you after the service to go over to the Harnish Activity Center. There is the Money and Ministry Expo going on where they'll be able to answer for you all the questions you have about what happens to the money that you give here to Hyde Park and help you answer some questions about your own personal financial stewardship. And we hope that next week, if not before, you'll be ready to turn in that commitment card to help us plan for the future. But remember, all of this, all of this is done with the deepest sense of spiritual awareness of that fundamental fact that is true of all of us, we need help gaining control of our lives to help us negotiate those fine lines between doing good and causing harm. And the only way to do that is to surrender to God. Because after all, we are not our own. We belong to God, and that God is a very, very generous God. Let's pray together. So God, here we are, asking for your guidance and your spirit of discernment to help us negotiate the daily challenges of life. Forgive us for those tendencies that we have to feel like we can do this on our own. Forgive us for the way that we mismanage our money and actually love it more than you. We offer ourselves in fullness to your power and to your presence that through the act of our financial generosity, we might align our priorities with yours and acknowledge the very good gifts that you have given to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so, as a response to God's word, and as an act of committing our lives to God, we invite you to prepare God's tithes and your gifts and offerings as we invite the ushers.